This is Ramdas here and now, and I'm your host, Raghu Marcus. I have uh, a new talk from Ramdas. Well, new is not the right word since it's from June 23rd, 1973. Uh, and um, what's interesting here is that uh, this is just a little less than three months before Neem Karoli Baba Maharaji left that body. So uh, Ramdas had been back to India where he went the second time in 1970. In fact, uh, I came back with him in the spring of 1972, and so he had been back in America for about a year teaching. And in this particular talk, it starts out uh, talking about grace, uh, the, uh, the Guru's grace to be able to, uh, for everyone to be able to get together to have this gathering that he was at on that day. So the Guru's, guru's grace to have satsang, which we were told many times, not just back in that day, but over time, that uh, being able to gather together with like-minded people is one of the most beneficial practices that we could uh, enter into. And so I, to this day, I always recommend to people, however you can find a satsang, a sangha, a like-minded group to be able to hang out with, uh, just, you know, have some food together, chant together, meditate together, um, listen to talks, uh, read together from uh, books of people who have tread the path before. Uh, and I might mention in that, uh, since I'm thinking about it right now, at ramdas.org, uh, we have a a fellowship program in which we um, put people together in different parts of the country, and and uh, they gather together you know, from small groups to a little bit larger groups on a regular basis. Uh, so I'm going to write to info at ramdas dot org if you have any interest in trying to uh, see about joining a group that may already be started. Uh, through this Ramdas Fellowship. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, we do uh, Ramdas immersion retreats in California. And you might uh, ask about that at info as well. Info at ramdas.org. So a little divergent there, but um, I just, it made me think when Ramdas talked about the, the, the grace of being able to get together. And then he talked about when life brings joy and prosperity, you say, how great is the Guru's grace? And, but then, can you say that when you've fallen down, when, you, when there's despair or when there's negativity, can you still say that? Very difficult. And there's one great example of this. A Swami, uh, his name is Swami Ramdas, who lived... Uh, I think until the 50s or early 60s of the last century. Uh, and uh, he has these great books. Uh, they're kind of like memoirs of his travels around India. And he was an extraordinary being that was as surrendered as anyone could get, at least in my mind, um, in regards to Guru's grace or Ram's grace. Uh, one story that uh, I, I can remember from the book is uh, he gets on a train, a very crowded train, and he goes into a compartment, and unfortunately there's no room uh, in any of the seats, but he spies up top where the luggage rack is a spot where he could actually curl up and, and lay down for the, and sleep for the night. So he sees that, and he climbs up there, and he says, Thank you, Ram, for the grace of providing me a space to be able to sleep. 
And then the train takes off, and in the middle of the night, when new passengers get on, a, uh, a very gruff, large man comes into the compartment and sees him there and sees that's the only place this man could put his bag. He grabs him by the scruff of the neck and throws him on the floor of the train. And Swami Ramdas looked up and said, Thank you, Ram, for whatever lesson I needed in humility, something like that, which seems outrageous, right? Completely, especially in our culture. How could that happen? How could you even have that kind of an attitude? Uh, it is possible, and uh, you might pick up that book, by the way. Uh, just just Swami Ramdas, and and this Ramdas had only one S. And uh, there's there's plenty of stories about his uh, his path, which was ex- as I said, very very um, extraordinary. And Ramdas goes on in this talk to talk talks about when this is a good one. Unless one honors Shiva, and uh, obviously Shiva is the god of destruction, so destructive forces, one can't unite or merge with Ram, and that's that goes hand in hand with the idea of of accepting and. Uh, making, uh, changing your relationship to suffering so that uh, one can see that through suffering there is growth. We can grow and we can get to a place where we are not rejecting suffering. So that's, uh, Ramdas talks about that. And there's a great story here which I've wanted, uh, Ramdas tells this in different talks. And uh, I've wanted to share this. I, I don't know if it's... It, it, we, we put out so many talks as podcasts that it's possibly there is duplication. We try our best uh, to not do that. But in this particular case, this is a rendering of a story of Ramdas meeting Lama Govinda, uh, a great Tibetan Buddhist. Uh, he was German, and he lived in Almora. And he lived there while we were when we were first in India, together with Ram Das. And it's a story of Maharaji uh, telling him to go see Lama Govinda. And the interesting thing is Lama Govinda and his wife, um, I can't remember which one, had made some disparaging <laughs> remark about Maharaji uh, in, in, in a letter to somebody that Ram Das was, was sent this letter. Um it's it's a fascinating story and uh how it uh ends up and the reason that maharaji sent ramdas is uh, to lama govinda is really interesting in that ramdas always considered the you know the buddhist path as as the as the deep difficult path using the intellect and and uh very uh, extensive meditation practices and the path of uh, bhakti was kind of a sloppy, easy way out. And he always considered it a lesser path, even though he had met Maharaji and he was obviously on that path. Um, and uh, it, it, uh, th- that's why I'm going to name this, uh, this talk, uh, this excerpt from this talk, um, basically the, the, the true secret teaching, because it all came fully full circle back to Ramdas about the eff- efficacy of the path that he was on through this meeting with uh, Lama Govinda. It's, uh, it's an amazing story and, of course, uh, really detailed and well told by Ramdas. And uh, I think you'll all really enjoy it. Uh, and it, this, this ends with uh, Ramdas uh, talking about his uh, being phony holy, and how he had gone off into a retreat in in Arizona uh, with the idea of getting deeply into meditative practice and so on. Um, And uh, it started out with him ending up uh, watching a lot of television and drinking beer. And it's it's really revealing, you know, uh, as usual from him with great honesty. It's it's just, uh, uh, this is a fun talk. 
Uh, I think you'll all enjoy it. So I will say no more, uh, but I should say, just uh, as I reiterate as much as possible uh, to you all about support for the Be Here Now Network, uh, be, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and you, you, know, you can make a donation and a recurring donation is great. And like this book by Swami Ramdas, for instance, um, there's a couple of them. They're, as I said, memoir, biography kind of books. Uh, just look them up on Amazon and, and pick up our link. Just copy and paste it. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and you'll see the Amazon um, uh, on Amazon on the menu and just uh, click that and uh, copy and paste the link into your bookmark bar so that uh, whenever you buy anything from Amazon, we get a little piece of it. Enough said about that. So this is uh, Ramdas from... 19 June 1973 and we're going to call it the true secret teaching on Ramdas here and now on the be here and now network just our being together here is such grace so much blessing for one birth Just as last evening, uh, Hari described how as Larry, with a, uh, a sore leg from a uh, fall during a morning ritual under LSD, and despite the subway ride, and despite the fact that nobody would join him to go, he still found himself going to hear Swami Satchidananda in New York City and he said he was already working on me that he could overcome my tamasic nature to get me to go through all that to get to him. You certainly cannot believe any less of this moment that forces are afoot in every one of our lives that brings us here. It is not by chance that we happen to meet. <laughs> and it's interesting to examine that uh, chance occurrence because it's um, certainly easy at the moment when it's all beautiful to say, what grace, what a blessing. Certainly the guru is smiling upon me to have allowed me to have satsang again. The reason it's worth examining is to see if the concept of some overriding plan can become such a dominant theme in our consciousness that when the when the drama changes, when the melodrama gets heavy, when you've just fallen from the tree, you can equally say, what grace? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Swami Ramdas is reported to have said when he had been thrown out of a temple one night, and had to sleep by the riverbank where the mosquitoes were particularly fierce and thus he couldn't sleep at all. He kept saying, oh, thank you, Ram, for coming in the form of mosquitoes to keep me awake so I could remember you. <laughs> in the Ramayana, There are two places in the Tulsidas version
where Ram makes it very clear that unless one honors Shiva, one cannot come to Ram. Now, Ram is a, an incarnation of Vishnu, generally connected with the preserving and maintaining and very loving and supportive forces in the world. Shiva, on the other hand, is often connected, associated with the chaotic or destructive or unpredictable or what are often called the malevolent forces in the world. And Ram says, unless you honor Shiva, you cannot come to me. There's a temple right at the very tip of um, India called Rameshwaram. Rameshwaram. It's where Ram did puja to Shiva before going across to Ceylon, to Sri Lanka, to rescue Sita, his wife. It's interesting to reflect on what does it mean to honor Shiva? It's so easy when you get high in a situation, whether it's satsang or whatever, meditation, and you say, oh, I feel the presence. I'm being given grace. But what about when you're despairing and you don't feel the presence? You think that's any less grace? Last night, um, Hari said one thing which I, I guess I disagree with the, ref the sort of attitude that he reflected. He said he guessed, he said he was doing karma yoga a lot because he guessed he was just too gross to do any other form of yoga. Now, I must say that I shared that opinion about karma yoga. When I went to India last time in 1970, I went in order to meditate, in order to get holy. I had been uh, lecturing and teaching in America and doing whatever my hypocritical poor light would allow. And my own hypocrisy overwhelmed me and it drove me back to the feet of my guru. I was just drunk for satsang. I just needed, I was hooked. I needed to get back to my connection. <laughs> and my plan was to check in with him get his blessing, and then go to a cave, which he would bless me to do. This was my mind, okay? And there I would sit with his blessing, and I would meet Babaji, and I would meet <laughs> Buddha, and I would meet Christ, and I would hang out with the astral team. <laughs> and they would, uh, they would give me all the secrets. And maybe I'd go north to the edge of Tibet, and I would get some deep teachings from the Tibetans and I would take deep meditation practices on various visualization exercises. I might even be walled into a building for three years, three months, three days, three hours, three minutes, and three seconds. And I thought, when I come back to America next time, boy, it's going to be different. I'm not going to be a, just a phony yogi. I'll be really the real thing. And I went to, um, with the 
group that was together at that time. I went to uh, Bodh Gaya, where Buddha got enlightened. Seemed like a good place to start, because I couldn't find my guru, because he was, as he is wont to do. <laughs> so we all enrolled in these courses, these 10-day courses, and we took a series of them. And um, it was very intense and very austere. And uh, we learned how to cheat and cut corners, but it still was pretty fierce. And um, there was no doubt that some headway was made in that meditation. But after about um, four of the courses, I could see that the slippage was increasing considerably. And that the thing that was missing was that my heart was very dry in that situation. I couldn't open my heart. And just at that time, I had been invited to uh, Shivaratri with uh, Swami Muktananda in Delhi. And I thought, wow, a good Shiva festival, that will really get me moving again. <laughs> but I didn't really want to just walk out on the meditation, because I felt that's kind of a cop-out. I mean, here I came to meditate, and I'm walking out, you know, to go dance and sing, like any sloppy bhakti would do. So. <laughs> So I entered into an arrangement with the most essence meditation teacher that during the uh, monsoon, I found out where he would be up in the mountains, and we went, made a survey. We went up there in advance, and we found another house that would hold three people, and we rented and had to fix up the house, put a new roof on, new water system, got the house all ready. And I arranged that when he went off for the summer, for the monsoon, summer monsoon, three of us would go and we would be with him, four of us, three or four of us. And we would just get all this intense training in meditation. And I thought, well, as long as I've organized it and prepared for it, now I can go dance and sing because I can do my sort of sloppy stuff because I'm really going to do the work later. Well, on the way to Shivratri, it turned out that we met Maharaji, my guru. And um, in my um, uh, puffed up pride, I said to him, uh, you know, like a good little boy reporting his work, I said, I've uh, arranged for this teacher and this house and I'm going to meditate. And I told him this whole story with a question mark at the end, like, aren't I good? Or isn't that wonderful? Or isn't this just what you want? Or... And his answer was, if you desire it. <laughs> well, that left me hanging. Because okay. what he was saying is, you want an ego trip? Go ego trip. Now, I couldn't understand that. What self-respecting guru <laughs> would say that meditation was ego-tripping? I mean, that's, that seemed like the height of uh, profanity, yogic profanity. Okay. So I thought, well, he's just a silly old man, and he doesn't really understand. <laughs> and maybe he's saying something much more profound that I'll only understand later after I've meditated. So I'm going to do it anyway. I said, humbly. <laughs> so when the time arrived, I um, went up there. And I was so happy to get to this place because um, up until then, everywhere I'd gone, there were always Westerners. And it turned out I was always hanging around Westerners. Who, and after all, you don't go to India to hang out with Western consciousness. And I was always hanging around Westerners who were looking to me for something or other, which seemed absurd. I mean, they come to the well to drink, and then they're looking to polluted water they brought from the city. You know, I mean, it's so bizarre. You know. But there's a certain culture shock in India, and it's nice to have something to cling to, and I was sort of it. So 
So I went to the mountains, and I was so happy. I was finally away from all of them. Right? And that draggy having to be with them and answer and deal with the stuff all day. And I put away all the musical instruments and all the bhakti schmaltz, and I was going to settle down for serious business that was going to bring me to God. You got the set of the mind? Well, when I arrived there, within about two or three days, Westerners, other than the three people that had been invited, started to trickle in. First three, then five, then eight, then eleven, until there were about twenty others. And they all said, well, I said, what are you doing here? Because I thought we were hiding out and we had kept it really secret. And they all said, well, Maharaji sent us. <laughs> He said, go be with Ram Dass. So we took over a hotel in the town. But I stayed up in the house with a group up there. And I wouldn't have anything to do with the people down there. I said, look, if you're in the town, that's up to you. But I'll come down and visit every week. But that's all. I don't want anything to do with any of you. I'm here for serious business. Well, then. Um, Another week went by, and the teacher didn't show up. And a letter comes from him saying, unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond my control, I will not be able to come this summer. And now I could see whose big hand was behind that. And there wasn't any doubt about that. So we uh, arranged to take over the um, Gandhi ashram in the town. We all moved into the ashram, and we ended up having an ashram for the summer. We all disciplined ourselves. We read the Ramayana and fasted and meditated and lived in silence. We had a very profound, good summer together, very beautiful, holy place. Okay, now, the next uh, component in that training program that is an answer to uh, Hari's point last night was when I got to India this last time, when I was with my guru, he said, who do you want to see when you're in India? And I said, well, I'd like to see Ananda Mai Ma, because to see the mother, to have the darshan of the mother, wow. He says, Acha, that's good. Who else? I said, I don't want to see anybody else, just you. So he said to me, see Lama Govinda. I said, Lama Govinda? I said, I've already seen Lama Govinda. <laughs> and I said, he's a very nice man. He's a good German scholar. He's a wonderful Lama, and that's lovely. And he's written some incredibly good books. But you know, and he says, see Lama Govinda. So that was that. So I kept stalling. And then I heard uh, that he was going to be leaving for Dallas. So Krishna Das, who's going to be playing the drums with me this afternoon, and uh, Anapurna and I went over to uh, visit Lama Govinda. Uh, just to put a little flesh on the bones, just to give you a little feeling for the little divine play in the whole dance. I really, let me tell you the story in, in the rich way, rather than the bare bones part. Because the means and the ends are one, by the way, so there's no conclusion in anything I say. Uh, it's just like hamburger, it just keeps coming up. <laughs> Okay, 
uh, we had included a picture of uh, my guru and Lama Govinda in, in the Be Here Now production. And in the picture was also Ligotami, Lama Govinda's Shakti, his wife. And she had taken the picture on an automatic camera, and we had cut her off in the one we had used in the book. And since we were not acknowledging anybody's contributions, we didn't acknowledge that she had taken the picture. And uh, since all her pictures had stamped on the back of them, taken by Lee Gautami, we knew she might have a slight investment in this matter. And I expected to get a little flack from her about this when I should see her. Now, there was a little additional matter that Lama Govinda had written a letter to a editor of Newsweek in Chicago <clears throat> who had photostatted it and sent it on to me, in which he said, these Westerners go to India and they take the first guru that comes along. They're so hot to get a guru. Take Dick Alpert. He went and he got hooked up with his second-rate mind reader. So now I knew that, see. So I figured if Ligatami gives me any trouble about the picture, I will uh, discuss second-rate mind readers. But otherwise, I won't do it. See, I mean, I'm not going to just start out with, you know. I just have a little thing in restore in case. You know. <laughs> Yogic love, it's just the social dance. You know? So the time came for taking pictures which it does at most of Lama Govinda's scenes. And uh, I said, well, I'll stay inside. We'll stay inside. You go ahead. And Lee Gautami says, no, you've got to be in the picture, too. I'm going to get back at you for, I uh oh, she just did it. <laughs> so as we were standing posing for the picture, Lama Govinda and I, with some other people, I turned to him and I said, do you really think he's a second-rate mind reader? <laughs> yeah. That's all. I just looked right at him. Well, he went through just long enough to go through the chain to realize that he had just been had. And he lit up, and we looked at each other with total love. We had just broken through all the formalities. You know. And from then on, our relationship was totally joyful. So that evening, the uh, five of us sat together after the other guests had left, and his mind was beautiful. It was like an exquisite crystal, like a beautiful jewel, very clear mind. Now, he represented to me the kind of meditative uh, jnana yoga, the intellect and meditation aspects of yoga, which to me have always been the manly, tough forms of yoga, see, as opposed to the bhakti and karma things, which are what you do if you can't do anything else, see, if your mind's too gross to do anything else. So I said to him, Lama Govinda, what is it you want me to do? Do you want me to go and uh, to study, do visualizations? What is it you'd like now? What kind of Maharaji sent me to you? He must have sent me to you for teaching. I now take you as my teacher. Tell me what to do next. I said, I can go on with my southern Buddhist meditation or my northern, going to northern Buddhism. I've been interested in the Nyingma Pa, and I can go on with my uh, Padmasambhava mantra, or what do you suggest? I sat as a seeker. And he said, no, you don't understand at all. He said, I've looked at uh, your book and all that. He said, um, he said, your, your path, he said, your path is the path of the heart. And he said, your heart is opening. It's all happening to you. You don't have to do anything. Now, he said that, and I wouldn't hear it, see. I said, oh, I know all that, but tell me, what should I do, <laughs> see? Because you certainly couldn't assume you don't do anything. Yeah. And he says, no, you don't understand. He said, you're doing your path already. So now, it, coming from him, see, I mean, it's one thing if a bhakti says to you, go be bhakti, you say, sure, he's protecting his own investment. But when Lama Govinda, he's got to go against everything he ever talks about, roughly, to tell me to do that when I've asked him for teaching. 
So in a way, it was incredible that Maharaji would send me to Lama Govinda to get him to tell me that my yoga, see, was bhakti. That was part of it, bhakti yoga. So I began to reassess. So later when I was sitting with Maharaji, I would say to him things like, um, Maharaji, um, how do you awaken Kundalini? I mean, just a question in the passing of the day, you know, passing. <laughs> and he'd say, feed everybody. <laughs> feed everybody. I mean, I'm ready for pranayam and uh, vastrika, you know, alam balam. Feed everybody. Maharaji, how do I get finished? <sighs> Love everyone. And all he kept instructing me was, and all of us, was love, serve, remember. Love, serve, remember. Now, the, I couldn't help but break up over the cosmic joke that I should go to India, to the deep, dark, mysterious East, to learn the secrets that will bring man to final realization, to bring them back home to the primitive tribes in the outer lands. Right? And I come back bearing the gift of three words, love, serve, and remember which have already been hanging around here for years, as I seem to recall Christ reminding us. And in the two years I was in India, I think in, the, in total, there were 14 days when I was not surrounded with Westerners, doing exactly the same thing I do in the United States. So what I was forced to recognize was, I was forced to do what we call a figure ground reversal. Because what I saw hanging out and talking about God with people as, was what you do until you do the real thing. And now I had to flip it over and see that maybe that was the real thing. And all the other things were support systems. Now, faced with the possibility that the rest of this incarnation, or at least at this time, my dharma was to do karma yoga and bhakti yoga, I started to examine the nature of these yogas a little more carefully, since I was stuck with them, apparently. And I must say, I shared that little tone of that quality in, in the way Hari put that, although I'm not attributing to him that he shares that opinion, but the tone that I got from the way he said it, that I'm, you know, you're so gross, you just do karma yoga and bhakti yoga. It's sort of, we used to think of there are gentle paths, like going to church on Sunday is a very gentle path. Then there are steep paths like Zen Buddhism, where you just sit and think of nothing. Right? <laughs> And most people can't stand that because that's too steep. They need a support system like a god or something or a church or a ritual to cling to. And there are these different steepnesses of path. And karma yoga has always been connected with doing good, gray ladies serving in hospitals and, you know, sort of a nice, gentle way to come to God over the next 10,000 incarnations. <laughs> So a deeper study of the Bhagavad Gita, which of course is the, the text for Karma Yoga. And I entered full steam into Karma Yoga. I figured, well, if it's my yoga, then I'll do it. Now, uh, 
when I came back to America in 72, I was um, living not in time. I was going to live like my guru lives. He's just somewhere until he isn't there anymore, and then he goes somewhere else. You never know when he'll be there or when he won't. I figured I'll live outside of time. Because time was really scaring me about the West. Schedules and you're going to lecture. Like you're going to lecture Thursday night at eight, like Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. And uh, many hundreds of people are going to be expecting your consciousness to get them off at 9 o'clock on Saturday. <laughs> So everything you did Friday night, everything you did Thursday, Friday, you know, if you had a lustful thought on Wednesday, that was going to affect Saturday morning. So you had to watch it, and you had to get so programmed. And if you had two a week, you know, it wiped out the whole week. You had to just sort of sit in like in a straitjacket to just stay together enough. And I was like, time was my enemy. I was always like afraid to let go. So I thought, look, I'm not going to live in time. I'm just going to live. I'll just be where I am. And people would call me from New York to New Hampshire, and they'd say, uh, <clears throat> will you be there tomorrow afternoon? I want to come see you. Meaning, will you be holy tomorrow afternoon at 2? I'd say, I don't know. They'd say, well, what do you mean you don't know? I'd say, well, I don't know where I'll be in that tomorrow afternoon at 2. Meaning, not only I don't know where I'll be geographically, but I don't know where I'll be in terms of my consciousness, because my consciousness, unlike Swamiji's consciousness, is not nice and even and smooth and together. My mind is a little bit like um, a roller coaster, and it's not any roller coaster that you ride the same route each time. Each time it's a different route, so you can't tell if you felt you get really very, it's all pouring through you, and everybody looks at you, and they see the highest light, and you say, oh boy, all I got to do is keep cool, and this is the way it's going to be, you know, and I can just be the transmitter, and so you make a plan for tomorrow at three. Tomorrow at three comes, and somebody drives up the driveway, and you think, oh God, do I have to see them? Oh God. You know, I want to see Perry Mason on television, and I've got to see these people. Now, I don't want to want to see Perry Mason, but I do want to see Perry Mason, see? Because I want to see Perry Mason, I hate these people driving up the driveway. And I don't want to hate them because I'm a holy man. I want to love them, but I hate them. Okay? Okay? So I thought, okay, I'm going to change all that. I'm only going to be holy when I feel holy, right? People come and I don't feel like seeing them, I'll say, go away. Or I'll just disappear. Or whatever. You know, I just won't be holy unless I feel like being holy. And when I'm holy, I'll be really holy. Because I was tired of being a phony holy man. Because if they've driven up there, they've driven from Ohio, see. And they come to see Ram Dass. And they walk in and you wait the last minute, turn off the television set, and you rush up. And <laughs> And you light an incense and candle, and you sit down. <laughs> and they come in, and you say, welcome. <laughs> well, that kind of hypocrisy, you can only live with yourself so long. I mean, it's just too heavy. It's just too ugly. You know, it's just too horrible. So, and my guru had kept saying to me, tell the truth. Tell the truth, Ramdas. He kept catching me not telling the truth. That was the, I mean, really little things, you know. I'll just give you a little quick example. I've, I've mentioned this in lectures in the past. But once a, uh, I won't tell the whole story, just a little part of it. A judge, uh, a high Supreme Court official from Uttar Pradesh came to have Maharaji's darshan. And we, <clears throat> we were sitting on the outer rim, the Westerners, and the Indians were in close, and, uh, which alternated from day to day. And uh, Maharaji gave this high court official a tremendous buildup about what an important man I was in America, which he had never done, and I never even thought 
that it was remotely relevant to anything he and I did together. He said, ex-professor, big university, you know, and he just full of lies, oh, incredible stuff. And he snowed the official, you know. Finally, the official, with great awe, really, because turned around and he said, well, I'm honored to meet you. And I said, well, I mean, how do you do? He says, perhaps you'd like to visit the high court. Now, uh, in truth, I had no desire whatsoever to visit the high court. I come from a family of lawyers. I've been in courts, and uh, I didn't go to India for that particular trip. So I said to him, well, that would be very nice. So he said, well, tomorrow at 10? So I thought, uh-oh. So I said, well, you'll have to ask my guru, figuring he'll get me off the hook. So he says, Maharaji, can Ramdas visit the high court tomorrow at 10? Maharaji says, if he says it'll be very nice, it'll be very nice. He'll come with It's always pointing like this, like, watch it, baby. I tell the truth. Just little ones, little social, those little white ones, you know, those little, those don't hurt anybody, you know. There was a woman with him one day, and he came up and he said, uh, do you remember her? And I said, oh, yes, and I didn't. And he said, uh, yes, she's Dada's sister-in-law, and Dada's from Allahabad. So I said, oh, yes, we met in Allahabad. She says, no, we met right here. I said, oh. Maharaji went like that. <laughs> it's just these little ones he was always getting me at. You know, it's like, tell the truth, babe. Come on, tell the truth. Truth gets you high. Tell the truth. So I thought when I came back to America, I'll just be straight. If I'm not feeling high, I won't make believe, I, you know. And I, I was trying to get very, very straight, okay. So um, it came, um, I sort of floated around the country just being wherever I was, and when I felt really together and like it was clear and I was calm and centered and loving and had something to offer, I was with people and it was beautiful, and I could feel Guru's grace coming through on people, and then when I wasn't, I just went off and, you know, read and studied. And, Uh, then I decided, <clears throat> I had just done a, a four or five lectures with Allen Ginsberg as benefits for Trungpa Rinpoche, and I decided um, those were in time. Those were the first things I had done in time. And then I uh, thought I'd go into a retreat for a month. So I rented a cabin in Tucson, Arizona, in the mountains south of it, which had a kitchen, refrigerator, stove, beds. It was a bird estuary, so there were lots of bird lovers. Those were the only people there, me and bird lovers. So I was not relevant in their universe. So it was a certain kind of privacy, even though there were other cabins. And I walked into this place and found, to my dismay, that the one other thing that the cabin had was a television set. Now, I had gone in to do a prayer. I was going to do a prayer for 30 days. which was the uh, sutra of the third Chinese patriarch of Zen, which is just a little tiny booklet, and I was just going to work with that for 30 days. But I spent the first eight days, roughly 12 hours a day, looking at television. <laughs> now, after I looked at television for the first day, see, I was so horrified that I might spend the next 29 doing it that I took a screwdriver and I out of my car and I unwired the television set. And I put it in the closet. And I put a blanket over it. <laughs> and put it way behind my bag and everything. And I closed the door and I sat down. And around 5.30 I thought, well, I could just look at the news. <laughs> so I took the television set out, 
wired it up again, looked at the news, and suddenly it was one in the morning, right? Three or four cans of beer later. Now, it's very hard to think of that as sadhana. <laughs> However, however, in that cabin, besides the television set and all the food that I had filled the refrigerator with and the bed and the bathtub that I could take frequent baths in and all the different ways I could play in my sensual delights, there was also my consciousness sitting in that cabin saying, far out. Imagine that, you know. You going to tell anybody about this one? <laughs> I mean, sitting me with that guy that said, gee, I think if I take the broccoli and put some of that spaghetti sauce over it, it'll be, and bake it, it'll be just like a pizza, and oh boy, and if I do, you know, and then I can quick get that done quick so I can watch Kung Fu, and, you know. Okay. That guy was doing his thing, and this other voice was saying, far out, or Maharaji was saying, teak, teak, it's the way it is, okay. Right. Okay. There was the voice in me that was sitting watching all this, just noticing it, witnessing it, watching with, at first, horror. See? Because when you meet Shiva in yourself, you are horror. When you meet him anywhere, he's really scary. In the Shiva Stocham, it says, when Shiva dances, the beings in all three worlds tremble. In all three worlds tremble because his dance is so violent. And when I'm sitting in there with the television set, you know, I get in this funny predicament. I, I get um, the food ready just as the program began. This particularly happened to me not long ago when, I, when the Watergate hearings started. See, Watergate, even more than my orality, is watching Watergate, okay? And I was sitting with the Watergate hearings just began, and I had the food, but I couldn't eat the food till I consecrated it. But I couldn't stop watching Watergate long enough to consecrate it. And if I didn't consecrate it quick, the food would get cold, okay? <laughs> I mean, you can't look at television and go, Brahma, 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 it's, you know, it's just too shoddy, you know. I mean, you're faced with these real dilemmas, right, in doing sadhana. And I think you should recognize that this is where it really hurts, you know. This is where we live most of the time, you know, unfortunately. Well, then the next week I managed to, uh, I would just unplug the set and put a cloth over it. I wouldn't put it in the closet. And I found I was getting a little bored, so I was only looking at television three or four hours a day. And then I got into feeding birds and studying bird names and things like that. By the third week, I was sitting a little quieter and deepening a little bit. And I could sit by the river for a few hours. And I was starting to eat more simpler food, and I was losing interest in television. And by the fourth week, I was really in pretty calm, centered space. And I was starting to feel that, that energy again. I was getting that place that you get when you've been here for nine days. That connectedness, that, uh, yeah, right. Oh, that's, oh, that's what it's about. Whew. Wow. Whew. Boy, this is the real, ah. Yeah. <laughs> you all know, I'm sure. Well, while I was in there, I looked at the whole scene and I thought, you know, really, if I'm going to do karma yoga, I really should just go into it, really just go into it. And I had a big folder of places that had invited me to speak. 
And I just kept them in a folder and wrote back and saying, I don't do that kind of thing, but if I ever do, I'll let you know. Benefits and lectures and all kinds of stuff. So I said, okay. I got the inner message, because I live totally intuitively now. Uh, because what I call, what we in the West call intuition, I would call the voice that's guiding me from within. And sometimes my intuition is a reflection of certain of my desires, and sometimes it's a reflection of a deeper voice. And I never know which one it is. And sometimes it tells me to do something, and I start to do it, and then it turns out it was just another ego trip, and I, it falls away. I, get, I see its impurity. And sometimes I start to do it, and it feels right on. Go, 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 and I just stay right in this space as I'm doing it. Then I know, right, that's right on. It's all a hunt and peck process of learning to hear that inner voice, because you can't hang on the coattails of the guru every minute saying, Swamiji, what do I do now? Should I sharpen this pencil? Now should I sit? What shall I do now? This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening, and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.